share some trends. And the trend is always that the Italians are the last to enter the room. You know? and how comes? <laughs> how comes? <laughs> PCS students who should be the first in the room, sleeping in the room, are always the last. And this is a bit bizarre. <laughs> and there are, I think there are no announcements. Ah, no, there is a, uh, so let me remind you about this trip in CIS. Uh, I have to tell also that the PCS students who know the building of CIS very well, but probably they don't have such a detailed knowledge about what happens <laughs> inside. <laughs> So also PCS students are strongly encouraged to participate because as I said, there will be a presentation of various scientific activities, which you think you know, but you don't, and also some visit to the labs, which uh, I think you have never been because you typically are restricting access. And uh, I think that's it. That's okay, thank you. Okay, good morning to everybody. So, um, okay. Uh, so up to now, essentially, uh, I mean, if I should make, make a short uh, summary of what we have been doing, uh, I've mainly discussed uh, the questions of extreme statistics or order statistics. That means basically you look at a collection of random variables and you look at the maximum among them. And maybe uh, you can also look at the second maximum, the case maximum. So I first uh, expose to you the, the theory of extreme statistics for IAB random variables. This was the subject of the three, four first lectures. And then I moved to the case of uh, strongly correlated uh, random variables. And um, as I told you, I mean, there, uh, the situation is, is, is much more complicated. And uh, in fact, uh, there are very few uh, systems or classes of systems for which we can say something precise about the statistics of this uh, extreme uh, in such uh, strongly correlated cases. And I treated in details basically two uh, big uh, uh, classes of, of, of systems. One is the case of uh, random walks and Ryan motions. And that was what I treated uh, during two, two, two lectures and a half almost. Um, and the other central piece somehow was this uh, Polaxx Pitzer formula and this eventually this uh, Spar Andersen theorem. Uh, which were eventually the main tools. That means, every, I mean, most of the questions related to extremes at the end boil down to some uh, uh, questions related to first passage uh, probabilities. And then I discussed the case of extreme statistics of uh, another set of strongly correlated ra random variables, uh, which is the case of random matrices. I was, of course, a bit fast there. Um, but I tried to tell you and show you some uh, natural and nice applications of extreme value questions in that context. And I had sort of as a guideline, I mean, I used this uh, model uh, by May, uh, this ecological model, which discusses the stability with respect to the strengths of interactions. Uh, and eventually, yesterday, I just uh, ended up the lectures by uh, mentioning some nice applications of extreme value statistics uh, of random matrices beyond uh, the random matrix theory. And in particular, I mentioned a few applications of these tracy rhythm distributions. So that was the core of, the, of these first lectures. They essentially was uh, dealing with uh, extreme value statistics. And during the last two lectures, uh, I want to touch upon another subject, uh, which of course is related to extreme value statistics, but which raises uh, new questions, as we will see, and which is the, the topic of uh, record statistics. So essentially, uh, I mean, the outline will be as follows. I mean, I can just uh, maybe tell you what I plan to do. Uh, OK, so today I would like to give you first a short introduction and some applications, although I will be relatively brief. And then uh, I will, again, use the same kind of structure that I used before. So I will first dis discuss the case of uh, IID random variables. And you will see that uh, the, the theory of record statistics uh, is, of course, well established, but is also quite rich. 
And then, uh, so that will be essentially what I plan to cover today. And tomorrow, uh, if, uh, yeah, at least that's my plan, uh, I would like to cover the, the, um, the, the case of uh, record statistics for uh, random walks. Because we have all the material to do that now, in particular with the spar anderson uh, theorem. Uh, and uh, you will see that uh, it's actually quite okay. I would like to show you this because uh, now that we have the tools, uh, there is, this is a very nice playground to, to, to sort of apply these tools. Okay. So maybe before I can just give you, uh, I will resend it uh, to you, but okay, well, I just already mentioned to, it to, to you. Um, probably I can give you two relatively uh, recent uh, uh, references. I mean, the one is, uh, okay, this is kind of self-advertising, -adv but uh, we recently wrote, wrote a, a complete review on that uh, with my colleague, uh, Claude Gondresch from Saclay. Satyam Ajunda, uh, and you can find it on the archive. So it actually discusses basically all that, and, and as you can imagine, I mean, the content of, uh, okay, of course the review contains much more than uh, what I will discuss, but uh, 005, 86, uh, so and this is one, and the other one, uh, is actually uh, some uh, short review, I mean, short, also uh, a nice review uh, by Gregor Verjan, uh, who was a student in Cologne, actually, but uh, we eventually wrote uh, rather, rather nice review, which you can find. It's, uh, it's actually, it's on the archive also, but I don't have the, the uh, it's, it's in GFIZ 46. Two, two, three. Oh, I, I, uh, now I realized I forgot something. That you guys cannot see what happens here. Okay, so what's what, what's written here? I'm sorry. Okay, uh, okay. So the, just if you just type, I mean, Gregor Vergen on the archive. Uh, he has a very nice review on record statistics and applications. Now I should remember that I cannot cross this line more or less, right? So I'm sorry. Yep. Okay. I will send you again these references, but. Uh, but in case I forget. Okay, so what's, uh, what's the subject about and what, what are we talking about here? So let's formulate uh, the problem uh, in a quite simple way. So I will discuss these questions in the context of discrete time series. So I want to think about a collection uh, of random variables, say x1, x2, xn, and I would like to think about this index i here, xi, as a time index. And so you look at a, a given uh, time series, I mean, okay, this is something that uh, we have been looking at uh, uh, quite uh, uh, in quite in detail, but okay, I mean, this is not the first time that you would see such a plot. So I, I would like to plot xi, sorry, as a function of i. And I would like, I, I will have this kind of, uh, of, uh, of data here, okay? So this is, say, i equal one. Uh, then here I would have a second point here, sorry. Now these are my values, I just plot them like this. Uh, I could have uh, uh, this value here, and then I will have uh, another value there. And suppose that uh, we have another value here. And I will go down with another value. Okay, so these are a set of uh, values, okay, such that this is uh, relatively, this is clear enough, okay? So you can also view it as a time, again, a time process like this, if you, if you like. And so this is your data. These are your data, sorry. And uh, basically, uh, you define uh, a record, say here. Uh, so where are my records here? 
So pictorially, so I will consider that the first value is always a record. Now, the record uh, is established at step k if the value xk is larger or greater than the previous values from x1 to xk minus 1. Okay, so this one is obviously the record. This one is not a record. This one is not. This one is another record. This one is not. This one is a record. This one is a record. This one is not. This is not. This one is another record. Okay? So in blue here, uh, I just look at the record. So typically, if I look at step k, uh, xk, uh, or record, uh, happen at step k. So let's, let's write it explicitly here. It's a definition. Uh, if and only if uh, xk is greater than x1, xk minus 1. OK, so as uh, maybe a remark already, uh, uh, exactly as I did for the case of extreme value statistics, I will consider the case where the xi's are continuous variables, such that there are no, no ties, right? There are no, no degeneracies. Okay, so with probability 0, two values here will be the same. Okay, so uh, I have in mind that uh, there will be continuous random variables. OK? So maybe just as a remark, so here, of course, uh, I, uh, what, what I define here, they are sometimes called uh, upper records. OK, so these are. Uh, Uh, but I could similarly define uh, I could similarly define lower records uh, which corresponds to uh, basically uh, if xk is uh, smaller than the minimum okay that's okay but to simplify a bit the the, the presentation I will mostly uh, stick here uh, to the upper record, and in fact, I will just uh, forget about this upper, and I will talk when I will talk about records. That will mean upper records uh, in the following. Okay, so there are, of course, uh, what are the questions that you may ask here, and what are uh, the, the interesting questions? Okay, so there are uh, the, the main questions. Say. Eh? Well, there is a first question somehow, uh, which is rather natural, uh, which is, for instance, if you look at the, your sequence up to a given step, uh, uh, a given step n, and if you ask, okay, what's the, the value of the record on, on that, uh, on that, on that, uh, the, the value of the of, of the current record? Then obviously, the value of this record here is clearly the value of the maximum among this set of random variables. OK, so in other words, if you look at the records of to step k, and if you ask what is the value of the current record at step k, then this is basically as asking about the maximum of this sequence up to step k. OK, so if you just look at the values of the record, I mean, which of course is, is an interesting question. Uh, well, but this question is essentially a question of extreme value statistics, which we have discussed before. So that's back to this. If I stick to this question, uh, then this is just what we discussed before. So I would say that, OK, uh, this, this guy we know, OK. But uh, of course, this sequence of records actually raise, uh, raises uh, another set, uh, various, various sets of other questions which are quite interesting and that we will treat here. The first one, which is, of course, not treated by, not included by in this, is how many records are there? Okay, so if you look at the sequence up to n here, how many such group points are there? Okay, so that's how many records? So that's the number of records, if you want. How many records are there up to step n? 
that's one first question that we will address here. Now, another natural question that you may ask is typically how long does it last to break a record? So typically, what's the time that I had to wait between this record and that one? Okay. So that's what people, that are, what I will call uh, the age of a record. Okay. So typically, uh, let's use another color. So how long does it take to, to break a record? And this is something that I will call the age. Okay. So how long does it take to break a record? Of course, this list is, is, is far from being exhaustive, but these are, I think, the two most interesting questions that uh, one can ask here, at least the most natural. And that will be, that will be the, the, the focus of these lectures, is basically to try to understand the statistics of both the number of records and of the, the ages of these records in these two different cases. First in the case of IID random variables, and second in the case of record uh, for random walks. Is that clear? OK. So now, of course, one may ask uh, why, we should, why, why should we care about this? OK, I mean, okay, it's a nice problem, uh, but uh, okay, is there uh, any uh, application of it? Uh, who is interested in that? So well, of course. Uh, one short answer to this question is uh, that records is actually becoming extremely popular, and uh, we are hearing about records uh, in the newspapers uh, every day. Uh, the Guinness uh, Book of Records is uh, one of the best sold uh, uh, book. I mean, each, each year. I mean, it's it's completely crazy actually, but. Uh, uh, people like records, okay, so that's, uh, so why should we care, right, so. Mainly, mainly I mean, why, 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 is, why is it, uh, uh, why are they interesting? So again, as I said, okay, they are popular, that's one reason, but we are scientists and probably it's not a uh, uh, good reason enough to study them. Uh, now, of course, they have uh, many uh, scientific, uh, many applications in the scientific context. Uh, probably the, 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 the one of the, the area where uh, this uh, is, these questions of records are actually quite uh, important are in the context of climate. Okay, so that's uh, one area where people uh, actually are studying actively uh, the sequence uh, of records, if you look at the temperatures, for instance, or if you look at the uh, yeah, many uh, various indicators related to, to climate. And in particular, they had, there has been quite a few uh, works during the last years uh, somehow to use records to uh, try to uh, somehow um, quantify or detect uh, some global warming, okay, so that uh, in the global 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 warming context, uh, there are a series of, of papers uh, by natural scientists, but also by physicists. And in physics, there are quite a nice, quite a few papers by Joachim Krug in Cologne, uh, which you can which you can okay, he has a few papers on that, uh, which you can probably uh, have a, a look at. Um, now, this is uh, obviously one nice uh, application. Now, again, uh, in a similar context, I mean, in a different context, but still a little bit out of, uh, little bit out of uh, statistical physics or statistical mechanics, uh, is the context of uh, evolutionary biology. Okay, so there, basically, then the, the idea is that uh, when you, when you study evolution or mutations in general, uh, in some sense, I mean, any evolution that, that successfully uh, spreads in a population has to be a record in some sense, in the sense that uh, if it uh, 
if it's still alive, that means that it performed better than uh, any other mutations. And uh, in that sense, uh, this must have been a record uh, in, some, in, some, in some sense. And there have been a lot of uh, work in that, uh, in that, in that context, uh, and in particular in what people call this, uh, uh, I mean, fitness landscapes and this kind of, uh, of, of ideas. Uh, and they have been actually quite, uh, uh, quite uh, popular uh, during these last, uh, these last years. Yeah. Yeah, so what I said, I mean, very, very vaguely, again, I will not enter into the detail. I can give you some, some, some more references, but what I said is that uh, if you look at the, the, the evolutions uh, in, in, that happened in, in, in biological context, say a mutation, essentially if it survived, it means that it performed better than any other mutations. And, and in that sense, that's a record, yeah, because it was better than the others, right? So typically, I mean, uh, the number of records could be something like the number of successful mutations, if you want. Okay, successful. Uh, so that's a uh, uh, right, uh, and a bit vague application, uh, of course, there. I mean, I will not enter into the details, but uh, um, now there are some other uh, uh, sequence, I mean, some other problems where people have studied quite a bit uh, the, 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 the record statistics, and which I already mentioned in the context of finance. Uh, I mean, the context of extreme statistics is basically the context of, of finance, right? So, <coughs> sorry. So again, uh, in, in, in finance in general, uh, when there is, for instance, I mean, if, if, you, if you consider the case where a price, the price of a stock reaches a, a sort of records, then it will, in any cases, I mean, in many cases, it will actually uh, create a, a burst of activity uh, in the, in the in the system, and these are, I mean, these records are usually washed out, I mean, watched out very, very carefully. Now, it turns out that, uh, so again, all these applications are uh, relatively still a little bit far from, from, from physics. I mean, this one, not that far at the end, but. Um, now, it turns out that during the, the, the last years, um, 10, 10 or 15 years, people have realized that uh, they have also a very nice, I mean, these questions of records are actually natural in the context of statistical mechanics. So there are various reasons for that. I mean, the one, I mean, first one that I just mentioned, but there is another aspect that I want to, 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 uh, um, to look at and to mention here, is the fact that records, I mean, can also be used not really for records themselves, but for the kind of dynamics they generate. So by this, I mean the following. So if you look at how the records, uh, so let me just uh, look at the, so that's this point that I want just to emphasize a little bit. So if you look at the, the evolution of the, of the record, okay, so as a function of, of, say, time. So what, what happens, uh, if you look at the, the current value of the record, okay, so it starts here uh, at some, uh, okay, I mean, let, me, let me write uh, an, explicit, an explicit series then. So suppose that I start here, uh, then I will go down, uh, I can go down, and then I will go up, and I will go up. Okay, so let's look at this simple sequence. So here I have a record here, I have another record uh, here, and I have another record there. Okay. So now let me look at the, uh, the value of the record as a function of time. Okay, so the value I'm st I starts here, then it will not move for a while, and then suddenly it will jump, and then it will stay at rest for a while, and then again it will jump, and again. So if you look at this, you see that it has actually this kind of staircase-like dynamics. And this actually uh, is very interesting because uh, it turns out that uh, in many systems, uh, the dynamics of uh, the, the object that you are considering is not uh, a continuous one, but it actually is triggered by this kind of, this kind of, of, of staircase dynamics. Okay? And in many cases, so for instance, one example that has been studied quite, quite a bit uh, is the case of, imagine that you have, a, imagine that you have an elastic line uh, suppose that you have uh, some elastic line, 
uh, in some disordered environment. Okay, so I have an elastic line here. And uh, suppose that you have some disorder, okay, so that uh, they will, this disorder uh, will anchor lo locally the, uh, your interface. And basically, uh, you apply, imagine that you apply an external. So, so this, this line can be, for instance, uh, a domain wall in the ferromagnet magnet between uh, up spins and down spins in an Ising model, for instance. Suppose that now you are sort of uh, acting with, with an external force here. And if you look at the, the, the dynamics of this, of this elastic line, well, what will happen is that uh, if you just act uh, with this force, I mean, for some, times, for some time, essentially, the line will not move. And then suddenly, it will move. And a part will move. That means that this guy, you will just dip in this, this, this uh, locally here. And then it will just be pinned by another set of, uh, of these uh, defects there. Okay, so these are defects that pin your pin your line. And what is happening, you see, is that the, if you look at the center of the motion of the center of mass of your, uh, of your line, then typically it will have this kind of dynamics. So it will not move for a while. And then suddenly, uh, there will be some kind of avalanche that will essentially uh, dip in locally your, uh, your interface. So this, this kind of staircase nice dynamics is, is quite uh, interesting because the, okay, there are not so many ways, uh, natural ways to generate some kind of such kind of dynamics, and uh, these records actually uh, do naturally that. Okay, so in this picture, for instance, I mean this, uh, this the size of this of, of this uh, of the time that you have to wait here, which are random variables, they are typically related to uh, the size of some avalanche. Okay, so basically. Uh, the time that you have to, to this is related to, 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 to a characteristic, some, some characteristic of, of, of an avalanche, okay? Some, of, some kind of rare events that suddenly uh, has uh, a rather strong impact on your dynamics. So that's uh, certainly one of the, uh, and people have studied that in many contexts, in ITC superconductors, for instance, uh, in, um, in spin glasses, in many, many different uh, disordered systems. Yes? Yeah, yeah, so, so okay, so yeah, there are two things. So indeed, uh, so I first consider a sequence of random points, and I look at the records of it. So these are these records. Now what I look, I mean, is, a, is a, I, look, I am looking at the process which is constructed from this record, okay? So this is this process here. And now for this process, I'm not interested in the records of this process. I'm just interested in the, the, the characteristic of it, so typically, uh, what will be the, the amount of time that I have to wait here? Uh, what is the amount of jump that I will have there? But for this new process here in, in yellow here, uh, I do not talk about records. But what I'm saying is that this one is constructed from the record sequence of some IID random variables, or some random variables, whatever they are. Right. Well, OK, this is, this is an interesting question, but you see that if your process uh, is, is continuous, then it's pretty hard to define what the records are. So that's why I started from the beginning with a discrete time series, because there I know how, how, to de how to define these records. But that's a good point. I mean, if you talk about Brownian motion, which is continuous both in time and space, well, there is no obvious way to define what a record is. So this is really well defined for such kind of uh, discrete, discrete time process. And eventually, you can define the records of Brownian motion by some subtle uh, uh, continuum uh, limit. Uh, but I would like to think about these records just for discrete time series. Because otherwise, it's a bit complicated to define them. You are right. Is that clear? Other questions? OK, so that's how, uh, um, that's how I. Uh, Came in, became interested actually in this problem. If you want to, 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 to read more about the applications, actually, uh, in, in particular in these two, in these three cases, actually, yeah, again, I just mentioned it before, but you can have a look at this review by Gregor Vergen. Actually, his uh, uh, records and applications. Uh, I forgot the, the title. I, I will, I will send it to you anyway. But uh, 
you can read a bit more about more uh, concrete applications. These are mainly uh, the case of IID random variables that are discussed there, but, but nevertheless, they are, they are interesting. Okay, so this was more or less the introduction. Uh, now I want to discuss, I mean, to go a bit, uh, uh, I want to be more quantitative and see what we can compute there. Okay, I mean, what can we say about the statistics of these records? And I will start, of course, uh, with the IID case. I mean, as you can imagine, I mean, the, uh, in general, the, stat the, statistics, the statistics of records uh, is a quite hard question, although the, the questions are very easy to, to formulate, uh, but they are usually much more difficult to answer. And it turns out that the case of IID random variables uh, is actually, uh, as you will see, is a very nice, uh, I mean, it's very well understood, but the theory is, is, is also quite nice. At least I like it, so I hope I will, uh, uh, I will show you uh, how nice it is. How nice and how universal it is. Because you will see that for IID, random variables, essentially the, the statistics of records doesn't depend on anything. I mean, it doesn't depend on the kind of random variables that you have. But okay, to understand that, uh, we need to practice it a little bit. for IID random variables. Right, so by this I mean that uh, I will consider x1, xn again. Uh, these, are, these are n uh, IID uh, variables. And uh, they have some uh, density again. So the probability that xi is uh, less than x is again uh, dy p of y. Okay, so that's the density that I will uh, consider here. So again, this is continuous, uh, and this is also symmetric again. I mean, I, I'm treating the, 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 the simplest case, yes, density, which is continuous and symmetric, okay? So it's just, these are just the same assumption, the same assumptions that I did for the extreme statistics to start with at least. I mean, of course, then you can elaborate a little bit. Um, and uh, okay, so uh, let me fix some notation. Uh, I will define as Rn, uh, and I will say that Rn is the number of records up to n. Two step, okay. I will use step because I have in mind that this is a time series, so it's a time step. It's not a step in the sense of a random walk, but uh, is that clear? So I have a sequence of n, and n for me is a time uh, because this is the, 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 the. So this is what I call Rn, and I would like first to discuss the distribution of Rn, basically. So question: What I, what can one say about the, the full? The, I mean, about the statistics of Rn? Maybe, okay, distribution is maybe a bit frightening to start with, so let's just say statistics of Rn. But you will see that we can actually compute the full statistics of Rn, I mean the full distribution. Okay, so first question that I want to, to ask will be, of course, the average of Rn. Okay. So to do that, uh, I will introduce, as I, some something that I've done already before, but I will introduce what I will call an, in, an indicator variable, which will play a very important role in the following, which I denote by sigma k. So sigma k is 0 or 1, and sigma k is 1 if xk is a record, and 0 if not. There are various ways to treat this problem for the statistics, for, sorry, for the statistics of Rn, but I want to introduce a framework which is, I think, first, quite natural, and secondly, which can also further be adapted to the case of random walks. So let's do this, let's do that. And then obviously, I can just write Rn as the sum from k equal one to n of sigma k. 
That's a nice way to think about this Rn as the sum of these 0, 1 random variables. Okay? So the full statistics of Rn is, okay, at the moment is still a little bit far, but let's look at the average value of Rn. So typically, can one say something about the mean number of Rn? So let's compute it. So let's take the average value of this. So what is, uh, what is the average value? So the first moment, okay, so Rn, expectation value, well, this is just the sum from k equal 1 to n of this, okay, this is uh, linear, I have a finite sum, everything is, is, is perfectly well defined. Now, what is that? Well, it has a very nice probabilistic interpretation. This is just the probability to have a record at step k, if you think a little bit about it. Think a bit uh, as you would do some experiments. Though this is, uh, no, no, this is an average value. Okay, so I have this uh, random variable. So where is, the, where is the randomness in this problem? So I have these xi's. I draw them from a certain distribution, certain density. Okay, so I will have a certain collection of random variables, and then I count the record. And then I make an average over this uh, different p of y. Okay, so that means that uh, I just repeat the same experiments with the same distributions. So Rn will be a random variables, and I want to compute the average of it. Is, is it clear? Now, my claim is that this, absolute, this, this average value is just the probability to observe is the probability that xk is a record. Is that clear? This is typically the number of times that uh, sigma k, that xk will be a record. So that's just this probability. Okay? Now, how do I compute this probability? Okay. Well, let's try to compute it, and uh, for this, uh, let me just introduce a method which at first sight might be a little bit heavy, but which can be adapted to higher, um, I mean, to, to other, other values. So uh, suppose that I have this, uh, this kind of, uh, of series here. And I want to compute the probability that so I have k here, and I want to compute the probability that xk, this is xk, and I want to compute the probability that this guy is a record. Okay? Now the first observation, of course, is that the pro this probability does not depend on what happens beyond step k, okay? Because the fact that uh, it is or not a record only depends on the points which are located to the left of this guy. Yes. Oh, yes, it's here, yeah. Thank you. Please. So, yes. Yeah, okay, this you have to think a little bit about it. Uh, for instance, if you were, uh, suppose that you are, okay, suppose that I ask you uh, in a simulation, Okay, uh, how do you compute this probability? This one, okay, so forget about this. How would you compute this, this probability that xk is a record? Okay, but so you want to have the probability that this one is a record, okay? Okay? Right, okay. So now this, if you want now to compute this sigma, sigma k here, so what is sigma k? So sigma k, another word to say it, so sigma k is either zero, 1 or 0, okay? Now it's 1 with the probability, say, let me call it this probability rk. Okay, let's call rk the probability that xk is a record, okay? 
Now, sigma k is one with probability, that's what it means, huh? with probability rk, and this is zero otherwise. You agree that the, I mean, either xk is, 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 is a record, and this happens with probability rk, or it's not a record, and then it will happen with probability one minus rk, okay? So now if you compute this, this uh, average value, then this will be one times rk plus one minus rk times zero. Plus zero times one minus rk, and this is just rk. Is it convincing enough? Okay. So now the question is, uh, how do I compute this guy? So again, as I said, I only need to consider what happens before this guy. Question? Okay. <laughs> so let's consider only this segment, because what happens after, I just don't, don't, don't care too much. And let's think, or let's say that, let's suppose that this uh, records at step k arises at some value y. So this one is a record means what? Means that all the previous guys are actually below this value y, okay? So rk is just the probability that all these guys are smaller than y, and since they are iid, this is just uh, the integral for minus infinity dy dx p of x to the power k minus one. Okay, there are k, k minus one variables on the left. And now, this guy here at step k is equal to y. So this occurs with probability py dy. And now I need to integrate over all the val possible values of y. Okay, so then I need to integrate from minus infinity to plus infinity. Is that okay? So again, I want, so I specify first uh, the, the, config, the probability of a configuration such that the, maxim, the, the, the value of the record, sorry, is at y. So this will happen with some probability which is simply the total probability that all these guys here are below y. So this is this one. There are k minus one points. And then this guy here, this, this last guy, is just uh, exactly at y. So this happens with probability py dy. And I need to integrate over all the possible values of y. Okay, because the, the records may happen with any values between minus infinity and plus infinity in principle. Is that correct? So now, okay, I think that we have understood this. So now you see, if you look a little bit at this integral, well, it's quite tempting to, to make a change of variable and to use this change, this variable, okay? So let's make a change of variable. And I will just set u is equal to minus infinity to x, sorry, dy p of y. So it's nice, right, because the Jacobian du is just dx dx, okay? So obviously this integral here, so let's take care about the bounds. So here I start this, this lower bound here will translate, so when x is minus infinity, u is equal to zero. And when x is plus infinity, u is equal to one because the density is normalized, okay? So this is just an integral from zero to one. Now py dy is precisely uh, dx. Okay, maybe I could have, uh, that's fine. I, I, I hope it's, 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 it's clear enough. du, and this is just u to the power k minus one. Okay, so that's really nice because, I mean, first you see that p of x has completely disappeared. There is no p of x. And secondly, of course, this 
integral is relatively simple to compute. And this is just 1 over k. Sorry? Exactly. So what, what, what comes out here is that this is universal. Okay, universal provided. Okay, for me here, universal is a shortcut to say that it's independent of the distribution P of Y, which is continuous and symmetric. Okay, now of course this uh, simple result suggests that there is probably another simple way to get it. Okay, and there is indeed a sim very simple argument uh, to obtain this one over K. So how can I get that? Well, look at the, the first K random variables. So a simple, simple argument. So what I am asking here, I have this x1, xk, iid variables. Now there is a maximum somewhere between 1 and k. And the question that I am asking when I compute rk is what's the probability that the maximum is located at xk. Okay, but this maximum could equally be at x1, x2, x3 of xk because they are just in identical. So the probability that the maximum occurs at one equals the probability that it occurs at step two and equals again the probability that it happens at step k. And in other words, this probability can only be one over k. Okay, so that's, uh, So the probability that the max, the maximum uh, is at uh, step k, is obviously is just equal to one over k, okay? So that's uh, it's uniformly, so the probability at this maximum, the law of this maximum is uniform between uh, one and k, and therefore it's just simply one over k. Okay, so this of course did not require this stupid calculation. So why did I do that? Uh, well, I did it uh, because, of course, I mean, when you want to compute some uh, more complicated objects, this kind of reasoning would be extremely useful, okay? Of course, in this case, it's very simple. It's almost trivial. So is that clear for everyone? Yeah, this probability, okay? So again, uh, look at it, right? So I have these IID random variables. Let's make, a, let's make this drawing here. So I have x1 here. I may have x2, can have x3, uh, I can have x3, uh, x4, and suppose that I, here I have xk. Okay, suppose that I want, let's, let's have it this way. So I have this sequence here. So this is one, two, three, four, say five, k is equal to five, okay? So I ask, I'm asking what is the probability that this one is a record? So this probability is equal to the probability that the maximum of this sequence is located at this stage here. But what I'm saying is that since all these random variables are just identical, the maximum will occur here, there, there, or here, or finally there with some equal probability. Okay, so if you ask, if, if I ask you where is the maximum? Well, is, it will be just uniformly distributed between one and five, it can be anywhere. And the probability that it's, that it's here or there is just the same, and therefore it can be only one over five here because k is five, okay? So I have some probability one over five that the maximum will be here, one over five that the maximum will be there, etc. So in other words, the probability that the maximum occurs at the last steps such that it is a record, is just one over k. Is it clear? So with that result, we can already have a nice uh, result, or a nice, uh, nice estimate here, because now Rn, so this is the rate at which, so that means that you break a record with probability one over k. Okay, so that means that with time, you see that this probability is decaying rather fast, 
I mean like 1 over k. Uh, and as a consequence, if you compute this, uh, this Rn here, then you see that this is just the sum from k equal 1 to n of Rk. This is what is written there. And this is just the sum from k equal 1 to n of 1 over k. OK? And so this is just uh, a harmonic series. And you know that for large n, when n is large, this will just uh, behave like log n. And if you want to know more, uh, the first correction you also know will be this Euler gamma. And then there will be some corrections of order 1 over n, which I don't care. But the main point here, okay, forget about this gamma e here, because I will not use it anywhere. Uh, but the point, really, the main point is that you see that for IID random variables, actually, the, the number of records grows extremely slowly when n is large. Right? So now, let's go a bit uh, further, and let's try to compute the second moment. What are the fluctuations of this quantity? Okay. Now, this is uh, somewhat uh, a bit uh, more difficult, but let's, let's do it. So how would I compute it? So let's, let's go for the second moment, or the variance, if you want. I would like to, to, to have the variance of, of Rn, OK? Uh, I would like to, to, to have the variance. Uh, and uh, yeah, OK, let's, let's go for it. So I want to compute, basically, sigma r square, uh, which is Rn square minus Rn square. So this one we know. Okay, this will basically be some log square n plus some corrections. Yeah, actually, I would, yeah, plus some corrections. Yeah, in fact, I will need uh, eventually these terms here, but this will be transparent. But of course, the, the, the hard guy to compute is this one, OK? It's a hard, I mean, it's a bit harder than what we did before, because you remember that Rn is sum of sigma k. So you can actually write it like this. So it's a double sum now from k equal 1 to n from k prime. And then I have uh, this quantity here, but this one I know. OK, so what I need to compute here is something more complicated, because these are the correlations sigma k, sigma k prime, right? Now, how do I compute that? Well, there is a first way to do that and to say, OK, uh, start to wave your hands and say, OK, I'm looking at uh, IID random variables. And uh, it's rather likely that the sigma k's are just IID random variables. If you think a little bit about it, uh, it's not a so trivial statement, because naively one have the feeling that there are some correlations. Now, indeed, uh, it's a theorem uh, that uh, the sigma k's are indeed IID random variables. This is pretty hard to show. And this was actually shown by, in a very nice paper by uh, Reni, I mean, the guy of Erdos Reni, Alfred Reni. Uh, here, I will show it uh, simply for the two-point correlation functions. Okay, so I want to show you that uh, you can compute this guy and show that this is equal, indeed equal to uh, average sigma k times average sigma k prime. The full, OK, uh, you can find uh, a proof of it, I mean, in the review that we did. I mean, uh, we wrote something about it, which is quite nice, I think. I mean, easy to follow, but nevertheless, a bit hard to, I mean, OK, to present right now. <laughs> so I prefer to show you uh, some computation of these two points, just for the two-point correlations, and show you how it works. Yeah, but they are not Gaussians, actually. So you need really to, to it, it still works. Yeah, it's uh, very nice. Uh, Pretty very nice uh, property, actually. But uh, this is based on the uh, exchangeability of the variables, on the fact that they are actually uh, uh, exchangeable. So they are invariant under permutations. 
So let's try to compute that. So what does it mean? So these two-point correlations, you see, I mean, uh, they have to be, uh, either they are, um, so wh wh when does, wh when is sigma k, sigma k prime non-zero? Well, you see, I mean, sigma k, sigma k prime is non-zero when both sigma k and sigma k prime are just non-zero, and in that case, this is just equal to one. So this quantity here, as before, is just the joint probability that xk is equal to the max of x1 uh, xk minus 1. Sorry, uh, is equal to, yeah, so it is equal, I need to have xk. I'll say, okay, probably it's better to have it like this. Okay, so I want xk to be a record. And I want k prime to be also a record. So to simplify the discussion, I will suppose that k prime is strictly larger than, than k. If they are equal, then obviously sigma square k is just sigma k. And so then what I want also, I want that uh, xk prime is a record. So that means that I want uh, xk prime uh, being larger uh, than all the previous values. So uh, I can uh, still write it this way, xk, x. Uh, k prime minus one. Okay, so I want this kind of configuration, okay? okay it's a little computation, but uh, it's it's good exercise. So, okay, we have this, uh, so we start, say, some value. Uh, you have this, uh, you will have that, you have this, something like this. And, Okay, suppose that this is k, and then this is k prime. So these are both records. You might have, actually, uh, both records uh, in it. Yeah, maybe the, then it's not very, I should maybe have something like that. Because in between, you can also have records, in fact. Okay, so this is the kind of uh, probability that I want to compute, okay? So this is also a record, but what I want to have is that xk itself is a record, and xk prime is also a record, okay? So first, is that, is that, is that okay with you? So this sigma k, sigma k prime, this correlation function, again, by the same kind of argument that I used before, when I computed rk, the rate, uh, when I showed you that, uh, that uh, so average value of sigma k is just the probability to have a record at rate k. You should be convinced that this two-point correlation function is exactly this probability that these two guys are just records, okay? Because if they are not record, then the value of sigma sigma k is, is just zero. Okay, so let's, yes. Yes, okay, uh, it starts from xk because, okay, I could also, Alternatively, I could I could have the whole series, but since xk itself is a record, that means that xk xk prime is larger than all the previous values. Okay, I could have this. Okay, if if you don't like it, you can just put that. That's the same, right? Because it's already since this one is already then it has to be greater than xk, which itself is greater than all the previous values. So that's that. Exactly, exactly, yeah, okay. So again, I mean, uh, another, uh, okay, if you look at this value of sigma, you can basically do the, the, what I did before, right? This, this uh, sigma k, sigma k prime actually can take only two, I mean, two values, zero or one. So when it's zero, okay, I mean, the, the, this happens with some probability, but it, it's one only when xk and xk prime are records, okay? So I need xk and xk prime to be records. This is the probability of this event, so otherwise it's zero, and then when I will ev evaluate this average value, this will be zero 
time some probability that I don't want to compute, which will be one minus this, but okay, this is some probability, uh, Q if you want. And then, so the average value will be zero times Q, so I don't need to compute Q. And this will be one times the probability that XK and XK prime are records. And this is precisely what I wrote here, okay? The probability that both XK and XK prime are records is precisely that. Is that clear? So let's go for it and let's compute it. So that's the, the same kind of computation that I did before to compute the, res, the, 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 the simple result one over k, but now of course it's slightly more involved. So how does it work? So again, k prime is strictly larger than k. Okay, so let's first look at the first sequence here. So for the first sequence, uh, so I want to compute sigma k. Okay, so suppose that this guy is uh, say, uh, y1 or yk, and this other, this other guy here will be yk prime. Okay, so the same, the same as before. So how does it work? Uh, it works like this. So you need to have k minus one guys, which will be less than yk. This is for sure. Now this guy here has to be yk, so this is this happens with probability pyk dyk. Now what are the possible values of yk? Well, yk actually can go, it can be as small as we wish, but it cannot be larger than this guy. Okay, because if this becomes larger than this guy, then this one will not be any more record, and you are lost. So actually, this has to be less than yk prime. Okay? Now what about uh, the next sequence here? So let's see. Uh, so here we have, we said there are k minus one points. Okay, in this uh, k minus one points here. Now, I need, of course, now that all the, these points which are here, they can be as small as they want, but still they need to be smaller than this value, okay, because I want it to be a record. So all these points here need to be smaller than yk prime. So this will happen uh, with some probability, which is basically uh, the integral from minus infinity to yk prime. Uh, say dx p of x times, well, I mean, to, to, to some power, which is basically the number of points that I have, okay? Agreed? Now, how many points do I have? So I have uh, basically k prime minus k minus one points. Right? So this will come with some probability k prime minus k minus one. Is that okay? And now of course this guy eventually uh, will take its value, so that means p y k prime d y k prime. Yes? Uh, k prime minus k plus one. Uh, no, because uh, no, because they are. Uh, sorry. Yeah, these these two guys are excluded, right? The the two extremities are excluded. Okay, so if I what you count, count all the points between this one and this one excluded. So it's k prime minus k plus one, and you need to get rid minus two because you don't want to count this one, and you don't want to count this one. Well, you just need to, to see with some examples. And, and Is that okay? And now it's not completely finished. I still need to integrate over all the possible values of yk prime. So it looks like 
rather complicated. So first we have to agree on this formula. Okay, and now we want to evaluate it. Okay, it turns out it's very simple. Now how comes? Is it so simple? So let's first do, we have seen a nice change of variable that, uh, that we liked before. So let's take, uh, let's make this change of variable first and let's call it V. Okay, so V, uh, V is just this guy. So that means this is just the integral from zero to yk dx px. Sorry, minus infinity. Yeah, I, I have, yeah, there is a mistake here. This is minus infinity. Okay, it can be as small as I wish. So I have dv is just p of yk dk. dyk, sorry. Precisely this guy. So let's, let's do it. So I didn't touch yk prime at the moment. Right? Now here, what do I have? So let's look at the, 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 the boundaries. So the boundaries, so when yk is minus infinity, this is just zero. And when uh, yk, pri yk is equal to yk prime, well, this is just the integral for minus infinity yk prime. Yes? Oh, there is already a yk prime? Yeah. Thank you. OK, so I just made this change of variable here. Now here, this is just v to the power k minus 1 dv. OK? So the bound here. The upper bound is minus infinity to yk prime. And then the rest I didn't touch. So it's to the power k prime minus k minus 1 p of yk prime. You like it? OK, so now I will do another change of variable, and I will call this new variable u, OK? It appears here, it happens there, and this pyk prime, dyk prime is the Jacobian. So I just, so what I'm saying now is that I'm doing another change of variable. I'm saying, I'm calling u this integral from minus infinity to yk prime dx p of x, such that du is p of yk prime d of yk prime. And now something simpler uh, will come out because, uh, okay, so this I don't, I don't touch. I mean, let's first do this. So this is an integral from zero. So minus, so this integral is precisely u. So this is an integral from zero to u dv v to the power k minus one. Ah, yeah, there is another an additional dv here, sorry, yeah. Thank you. So this is this integral. Okay, maybe yeah. not too confused. Let's do it this way. And now, what, what about this integral? So this is just u to the power k prime minus k minus 1. And p of yk prime dyk prime is just du. And now I, in, I have to integrate. I mean, now it's the same as before. So when yk prime is minus infinity, then u is 0. And when it's plus infinity, this is 1. So you see that now I have a fairly simple integral. So things are getting better. We started with something quite ugly. We have something quite nice here. Nice because, of course, we can easily do the integral over v here. So that will be just 1 over k times u to the power k. This u to the power k will combined with this one, and you will get simply 1 over k times an integral over v from 0 to 1. But now, as I said, sorry, an integral over u. And this is just 
u to the power k prime minus k minus 1 plus k. This is just u to the power k prime minus 1. And what you find is that this is just 1 over k k prime. Yes, it seems, yes, you can do it, but, well, you see that it becomes a bit, uh, okay, no, this, no, no, you, you can do it, you can do it, but uh, it's a bit, um, yeah, it's, it's a bit, okay. Yeah, instead, what, what you can do, I mean, and that's, the, well, that's how the proof works, is basically that you, sh you really study the, the joint law of the, of the sigma case, so you write something which is supposed to be the joint law of the, the sigma case. Bit, it's a kind of, I mean, similar to what you are saying. Uh, and then, okay, uh, by manipulations uh, and also some probabilistic arguments, uh, you arrive at the fact that this just has this factorized form. That's, that's more or less how the proof works. Um, okay, there is one subtility is that it's not exactly sigma case that is, uh, it's some, function of sigma case that is studied. It's joint law of some function of sigma case, but which you can. So now we are, we are, we are done, right? Because you remember that sigma, one over k is just the, 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 the average value of, of sigma k, and one over k prime is just the, the, the average value of sigma k prime. So in other words, uh, we are done because you see that we have shown that sigma k, sigma k prime, is just uh, sigma k, sigma k prime. Yes, sorry. Yes. So, yeah, so this holds actually, okay, uh, I suppose here that k was less than k prime, strictly, okay, and then if I do, the reverse, so if I do k prime, uh, I will obtain the same thing if, if I look at k prime strictly uh, smaller than k. So there is no real factor of two, I mean, it's just that these are two different objects. Yes. Ah, yes, so when, when I, then, of course, when I will do the, so here this is just for fixed k and, and k prime. Then when I will do the sum, of course, I will have to consider both, both, yeah, yeah. I will come to that in a minute, yeah. Now, so this, this is a computation. Now, of course, uh, you can of also compute sigma k square. I mean, if that means the case where k equal to k prime. And this, of course, because sigma k is zero or one, this is just sigma k. And this is just one over k. Okay? Is that fine? So now, now we are ready to compute uh, Rn. Square. Right? As you said, now we have to take care. So I will compute the full, uh, I will compute the variance immediately because there will be some nice uh, simplification, uh, I hope. Well, it's not that I hope. I know that there are some simplifications, so. <laughs> okay, so let's see. Sorry. Here? Okay. So. Yeah, so sigma, sigma k is 0 or 1, okay? So if it's 0, sigma square is 0, and if it's 1, sigma square is also 1. So that's the, the same, um, that's the same as sigma k. This is just 1 over k. Yes? Counterintuitive? Why? Yeah, the fact that they are, uh, anti they are not, they are, they are, yeah, yeah, I agree. I mean, I agree with you. I mean, that's. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, uh, you agree that this result is, uh, is actually, uh, yeah, I mean, I, one of the reasons, again, is, is, is that there is some, 
in fact, uh, <coughs> the fact that the sigma k's are uh, uncorrelated is not related, is, is completely independent of the fact uh, that the, the variables themselves are correlated or not. It only uh, depends on the fact that they are in exchangeable. But otherwise, I mean, it's not a matter of correlations between the x k's. That's, that, that's, it. That's, in, that's a good point, yes. It's really a matter of exchangeability, and this is something I think that we don't have a very nice intuition of, I mean, ex except if you have been playing with this for years. Uh, uh, otherwise, uh, I agree, it's, 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 it's really a, a non-intuitive result. So let's see how it works. So we have we had this result. I mean, we have that, right? So we have this, and then uh, we have this sigma k, I suppose. Uh, k, yeah, which I could write it this way again. OK, and the sums are going from 1 to n. I mean, since there are many of them, I don't want to write them. But OK, so this is rn square, and this is the, the average of rn times the average of Rn, OK? So now what I will do here is that I will just uh, disentangle the diagonal terms, k equal k prime, and the off diagonal terms, OK? So I mean, I will just write it as sum uh, over k plus the sum k different from k prime. And here, OK, here I have uh, what I have. So I have 1 over k. I guess I can immediately write this, this thing like that, right? Right? So this, we know, is just the sum of 1. Sorry, it's just the sum of 1 over k. So this is just this sum that, that, that we have known before. It's just the sum from k equal 1 to n of 1 over k. And now this we also know actually because this are just this is just one over k k prime. Okay, so I will write it in this way. It's kind of trick, but uh, so I want to write it as the sum from k um, uh, to k prime, unrestricted from k one over k k prime. But when I do that, I have to subtract the term, the diagonal terms, OK? So I'm doing that, minus 1 over k to infinity, 1 over k squared. So I'm claiming that this is just that. I hope you will agree with it. And this, OK, eventually, this is just the sum over k, k prime of 1 over k, k prime. Is that fine? Can everyone read what I write here? I realize maybe it's too small. No, you can read it? OK. So now if you can read it, do you agree with it? OK, so now it's, if you agree, I mean, then, uh, then it's done, because you see, I mean, that the bad guys just disappear, right? This guy comes with a plus, this one with a minus, and I'm, I'm done. Yeah, sorry, 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 sorry. Okay. So at the end, you see that this guy is very simple. It has a very nice analytical structure. This is just the one, the sum of one over k minus the sum of over the one over k squared. Sorry. Yes. 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 The counterintuitive result. Yes. Um, we should expect one over k squared. Well, what is unclear? No, no. Okay. Uh, so this one, uh, this one, I think. Okay, this one is is what it is, right? I think this one should be okay. I mean. Uh, if we try to reduce. The I, yeah. So the, this does not work. Yes. I mean, there is no. So the limit k equal k prime is uh, is indeed uh, singular. But this has to, I mean, okay, I think it's, it, it's not related. What is, it's not related to that result, which I find a bit counterintuitive. What is counterintuitive to me is that, okay, for k different from k prime, 
is that you can write that, that they are really uncorrelated. Now you are pointing out another point, or another aspect, which is that the limit k goes to k prime is a bit singular, but this random variable sigma k is also quite singular, right? I mean, sigma k is 0, 1, so, okay, there is no continuity in the behavior of it. Uh, you mean to see if I want to do that or this one? No, yes. In the computation that you did for the correlation, so between k and k prime. Okay. There is no. Uh, no, it's. There is one way to see that it breaks down k equal to k prime. Uh, yes, there should be a way. But yeah, I mean the point is that I really assumed that uh, yeah, for instance, well you see, I mean look look at k prime equal to k in my formula here. You have this one of, of the over this probability that come th that pops up, for instance, which is completely crazy. I mean, probabilistically, there is obviously no reason that one over this probability uh, occurs. And I really had to assume when I when I did this uh, this this this. Well, I really this disentangled the two blocks. I mean, first from zero, from one to k, and then essentially from k to k prime. But really, when k is equal to k prime. Uh, this, this, this piece here has, doesn't mean anything. So in other words, when k prime is equal to k, uh, this, this part here has to be understood as essentially as uh, it, that disappeared. But it's really a singular, I mean, yeah, it's, yeah, no, that there is no, yeah, okay. Maybe there is a nicer way to see this limit, but uh, I, I don't have a good feeling of it, at least. Okay, so that's our result. And, uh, okay. So, what I want to, uh, to say now is that, uh, okay, so it's, you see that it's rather interesting because uh, the final result is, is fairly simple. And it's just this, uh, it's just that this is this one, one over k minus this one over k square. You see, it has a very nice structure. And of course, for large n, uh, we know how it behaves, right? Because for large n, this will again be log n. This one will, will be a constant. So here we know that this is log n plus gamma e. And this is this nice sum, if you want to write it. And then you will have some terms which are of order 1 over n, which you can get easily. I mean, these are harmonic numbers uh, if you really need them. So what does it mean? It means that uh, you see that Rn square, so the variance, scale like log n. So that means that the typical width of the distribution is actually of order square root of log n. So in other words, if you look at the distribution of Rn, so uh, now if you really, so that means that, uh, now I, I need to introduce some nice notation, I suppose. Okay, so let me uh, introduce this notation, P of Mn, which is just the probability that Rn is equal to M. So how does it look like? Well, uh, this, if I plot it, so the average value is log n. We have seen it. So if I plot this as a function of m, so it's centered around log n for large n. Okay, there is this gamma e, but and then it has some shape, which I don't know at the moment. But still, I know something. I know that the width. Uh, is is of order square root, I mean, it's more than order, in fact. This is really square root of log n, okay? The coefficient is 1. Okay? So the relative fluctuations, they go to 0, I mean, like 1 over square root of log n, but in a very, uh, I mean, slow way. Now, maybe I can, uh, okay, now two options. Uh, either I show you how one can compute, maybe it's nice, so maybe I can show you what, what we can say about the distribution of this quantity. 
and then next time I will discuss the edges. So next time I will do that, I will discuss a bit the edges, but you need to be prepared because this is a little, well, okay, it's not very difficult, but uh, yeah, one, one needs to compute a few things. Okay, let's go with it, with this guy, because it's nice. Okay, so the main result uh, is that eventually this is a simple Gaussian. Okay. So how does it work? And why is it a Gaussian? Okay, there is uh, the easy way, uh, the, the, the easy way to show that uh, is to remind you that Rn is the sum from I equal, so Rn is a sum of random variables and the sigma i's turns out to be iid. Okay, so I, 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 I told you this, I computed the linear correlations. I showed that the linear correlation, the two-point linear correlations uh, was basically decoupled, but the sigma i's are iid random variables. Sorry, they are independent. But they are not identical, right? Because we have seen already that the, the average value of sigma i goes like one over i, okay? Could compute sigma square i, we have seen is sigma square is also one over i. So these are these Bernoulli random variables. So we have to face uh, the sum of independent random variables but which are not identical. But it turns out that uh, nevertheless it goes to some Gaussian that are, um, not identical. Now you can still show that they, okay, that there is this extension of the uh, central limit theorem, which is called, which still converges to the Gaussian under what is called under the name of the Lindemann condition, uh, Lindeberg, excuse me, excuse me, Lindeberg condition, and this is, uh, this is still, uh, okay, I will not enter too much in that, but, uh, the Lindeberg condition in this case uh, tells you that you still converges uh, to, 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 uh, to the Gaussian. But okay, I want to show you something different uh, because there is uh, much more structure uh, in this problem. Uh, and in fact, it turns out that this problem of records for IID uh, can also be mapped on the problem on the random permutation. So I already discussed random permutation yesterday. So I want to show you that the random permutations are also, uh, are also behind this problem. So how do I see that? So to do that, I will do the following. Uh, I want to compute uh, this quantity, P of R n m. So this is probability uh, that R n is equal to m, and this is what I denoted by uh, P of m n. Now, to see why uh, these guys uh, happens, uh, it's interesting to look at the generating function of P of mn with respect, with respect to m. Okay, so what I will compute basically uh, is the sum from m equal one to n. So m, the number of records cannot be greater than n. You remember because this is the number of records. So m has to be less than n. It's an integer and it has to be uh, between one and n. And I want to compute this generating function. Okay, so let's, uh, let's compute this, uh, this guy. Uh, okay, we'll not give, you, give it a name, but this is a generating function. Okay, we have seen already this, uh, this, this kind of object. Now this generating function, you see I can also write it, there is another way to write this, this thing, which is just to, to, write, to write that. It's the rewriting. It's z to the power rn, right? So if you start with that, and if you want to write what this quantity is, then you will realize that this is exactly that, okay? Now why do I write this in this way? Because this is uh, just the sum of, of sigma i, okay? And the sigma i's are iid, 
okay? The, the, sorry, the, they are independent, excuse me. They are not identical. They are uh, independent. So because they are independent, okay, this is still equal to Z, okay? The product from one to N of Z to the power of sigma I, I just use that the, the exponential of the sum is the product of exponentials, and this is because now these sigma i's are iid. Sorry, they are independent. Uh, this is just now the product from 1 to n of z to the power sigma i's. OK? Now, this I know how to compute now. I know how to compute because sigma i can only take two values, 0 or 1 and it will be 1 with probability 1 over i, and 0 with probability 1 minus 1 over i. So in other words, z to the power sigma i is just what? So either it's z with probability 1 over i. OK, so that's. OK, I'm sorry, I'm just doing this computation here on this corner of the blackboard. OK, so if sigma i is 1, then z to the power sigma i is 1. And this happens with probability 1 over i, right? Because we have seen that. And then otherwise, is what? Well, if sigma i is 0, then this is just 1. And this occurs with probability 1 minus 1 over i. So I know what this quantity is at the end. This is just a product from 1 to n of what? So it's z times 1 over i. Plus 1 times 1 minus 1 over i. Is it OK? So this, you can still rewrite it in a slightly different way. So let's see. What's the best way? So I have a 1 here. Let me go take out this 1. And then I will, I will have plus z minus 1 over i. OK. Nice. OK, so this is just what? Uh, this is just uh, the product of, so I, could, I can do that, z plus i minus 1 divided by the product over i, so this is just factorial n. And here I have a product, sorry, from i equal to 1 to n. So it's a kind of generalized factorial. So how does it look like? What is this number? I mean, it's not a number. What is this function? How does it look like? Uh, it looked like the, the following. So I have a generating function, and so what is the generating function uh, is about? So it's, again, this is this guy. So in principle, now, if I know this generating function, then I can extract Rn, OK? Because if I know the coefficient of z to the power m, I can extract p of mn. So that's, that's the idea. So it has this, this structure there. So let me just, OK, I can still write it this way. So it's z. So let's just write it as it. So for instance, for i equal to 1, this is z. Then from i equal to 2 is just z plus 1. So it's a kind of rising, uh, rising factorial. I mean, z plus 1 times z plus 2. So it's, uh, of course, it has, it has a nice structure. Divided by factorial n. Okay, now this, okay, I don't know if you have seen that before, but these uh, functions are uh, relatively well known in combinatorics, and it turns out that, uh, so it's a polynomial in Z, okay, it's a polynomial of degree n, which one expects because it was there, and the coefficients actually are known, uh, and okay, they, so let me, it, I can still rewrite it like this from m equal to 1 to n, z to the power m, and then I'm almost, 
uh, done with what I want um, with what I want to have. Uh, so I have this one over factorial n. Okay, I, I, I leave it outside for the moment. So I'm saying that this kind of polynomial here is, is well known, and okay, it still can be the coefficient. Uh, let me denote it this way. So these are not combinatorial factors. I mean, these are not the n choose n that you know. Uh, uh, usually, uh, they are called the stealing numbers. Stealing numbers, there are many of them, and uh, there are uh, several kinds. So these, these, these are the stealing numbers of the first kind, and there are also the signed and unsigned stealing numbers. So these are the unsigned stealing numbers of the first kind. Okay. Just stick it for stealing numbers here. I will not do so much with these numbers. I just want to explain you what they count. So, okay, once we know that, maybe just, uh, just to, to finish it, uh, suppose that we know what these numbers are, well, you see that you can do them if you take Mathematica or whatever, uh, uh, what you prefer. I mean, you could uh, extract easily, if I give you an n and an m, you could easily extract these numbers in principle, right? You have these polynomials here. You just look at the coefficient, and you could tell me, okay, what they are. Now, it turns out that they have a very nice interpretation, and uh, I will tell you in a minute what it is. But before, before that, I just want to tell you that once I'm able to write the things like that, then basically, uh, I can extract directly the p of rn equal to m. Then this is just this number, by definition. Okay. Okay. So I just compare this formula here with that formula there. Okay. So this p of m n here is supposed to be the coefficient of the term z to the m of this polynomial in z. And so I immediately get it. Now, what, what are these guys? So it turns out that this nm here, these stealing numbers, they count the number. So they actually play a role in the, in the context of permutations. And they count the number of cycles in which you can decompose a, a permutation of size n. So what does it mean by this? Ah, maybe, maybe an additional remark here. You also see that the, the dependence on p of x has completely disappeared. Okay, so the, the xi's, I mean, that could be uh, uniformly distributed, that could be uh, Gaussian numbers, that could be uh, symmetric exponential numbers. This is completely universal, actually. And by the way, uh, this is not an asymptotic result. I mean, already for n equal to three, this is fully universal, which is not completely intuitive. I mean, okay. Once you know that it can be mapped onto permutations, then it's true that uh, this magic uh, is sort of disappearing a little bit. But OK, the connection, the true connection to permutations is hard to show. I will not show it to you. I just want to pinpoint uh, this, this connection here, that this NM here, this, this Stirling numbers, they have annotations because they count something which is relevant. Uh, and they count. Uh, the number of permute the, sorry the number of cycles of size m no sorry this is not it sorry sorry uh, uh, what I want to say um, yeah okay counts excuse me Counts the number of permutations of n elements, uh, which can be decomposed in exactly m cycles. So basically, that tells you that the number of records is associated to number of cycles in a given permutation in exactly m cycles. So maybe, OK, let me remind you uh, what these cycles are. So let's take, uh, uh, for example, let's take a simple permutation. So let's take n equal to 4, for instance. So I have one permutation, which is like this. So I have 1, 2, 3, 4. And one of the permutations that I consider is basically 4, 2, one and three. So as you probably know, when any permutation, so this is one permutation here, sigma, well, this is 
let me call it tau. Uh, any permutation can be decomposed in cycles, and this can be done in a unique way up to a reordering of these cycles. But what is, uh, what is basically um, a cycle here? So you start from one, uh, one is sent to four, four is sent to three, three is sent to one, and you are back to your cycle, okay? So you have a first cycle here, which is one, four, three, okay? So this is one cycle, and then you have another trivial cycle, which is this one. Two is sent to two. Now, so here typically the number of cycles is two, okay? And you can do that in a unique way. Again, up to a reordering of them, two cycles. And then in general, uh, any uh, permutation can be decomposed in, into cycles. And uh, an interesting question in the, in the, in the, in the, in the study of this, of this group uh, is how many, I mean, it's typically how many permutations can be decomposed in exactly M cycles. And they can be enumerated, and uh, this is what these uh, Stirling numbers uh, do count, okay? So, uh, I will not say more uh, uh, about it. It turns out this already suggests that there is a strong link between uh, record statistics and, and, uh, and the random permutation problem. Uh, for those of you who like this, uh, these things, I mean, you can read this uh, very nice book uh, by Flajolet and Sedgwick. where they explain this in, in great detail. They have this fantastic book, uh, which is called Analytic Combinatorics. Okay, it's, it's, this is mainly math. And then when you have this, uh, okay, people have studied uh, the, the large, I mean, the, the, the large and asymptotics of, of, this, of, this, uh, uh, of these numbers. And for large n, you can indeed show that this is a Gaussian. Okay, so I just end up with that. Uh, in fact, you can also get the Gaussian from the analysis of this generating function. It's a little bit, uh, it's a bit, little bit complicated, but in the large n limit, uh, this is what you get. You get that this is just m minus log n squared divided by two log n, and there is here uh, square root of two pi log n, basically. Okay, so. Uh, so I will end up with that. I mean, uh, just, okay, I mean, of course, this, this last, uh, last part on the, the full distribution is a bit more technical, but I wanted to show you this. Okay, I like this connection with, this, uh, with these permutations. Uh, I find it quite nice. It's a bit mathematical, but it's quite nice. But the first part, I mean, I hope that, okay, I convince you at least that the first part where I computed first uh, the mean number of records and eventually the, the, the variance, uh, you see, I mean, these are relatively simple, I mean, not, Relatively simple computation, so a little bit cumbersome, but which at the end uh, simplifies uh, in, a, in a very nice way. So one should be, one should not be afraid to to, to compute them. Uh, I mean, because with some effort, uh, you, you will end up with some nice formulas. Um, so that's uh, basically what I wanted to say for the statistics of the the number of records. So I guess that what I will do probably uh, tomorrow is that I will discuss at which degree of details this, I don't know yet. I will discuss a bit the statistics of the ages. Maybe I will show you, I mean, what kind of observable that we can get, I think. Yeah, we have, we have all the material now to do, to, to, to do that. I've shown you how to, to do these computations, I mean to do. At least I've shown for you, I've, I've done for you the, the computations. I hope that you could follow it. The same, same kind of computations can be done for the, for the ages. And, Eventually, one has a very nice expressions for the distribution of the ages. And then um, I will go, I mean, I will show you how to extend these things uh, to the case of um, random walks. In fact, the case of random walks is, is almost a little bit simpler. I mean, uh, since we know already now the spar andersen formula, um, you will see that uh, spar andersen already did all the job for us somehow. So uh, we will use this uh, result. 
um, and combine them with uh, some okay some similar kind of reasoning, uh, and that that will be more or less the the, the end of, of the lectures then. Okay, thank you very much.